Hi, I'm Kevin McCarthy, Chief Technology Officer for Dover Motion. Today's video is going to be a little departure from some of the more technical ones of the past. I will be telling a more colorful tale, one that I think you will enjoy. As it happens, I know a bit about fluorescence. I've been involved with fluorescence since I was nine years old. I was born and raised in Atlantic City, New Jersey. On the boardwalk, there were piers, saltwater taffy, GM showroom, you know, lots of things to spend a little time on, toy shops. But in particular, there was one place that caught my attention, and that was a mineral shop. And it had the most interesting crystals and mineral formations. And in the back room, there was a blacked out uh, section room with eye holes and a pair of buttons where you could press either a long wave or a short wave UV and see these minerals, UV lamps would turn on and it was transformed into this totally amazing fluorescent mineral collection. If we do a pullback and zoom here, uh, you'll see that in front of me on the table are a pretty reasonable assortment of fluorescent minerals. Now, this is not my entire collection, but it's more than representative for the purposes today. And here you're seeing these minerals in daylight and I think it's time to bring down the lights. So we have two wavelength UV sources here today. So you can see some pretty vivid colors. Here we have a pair of specimens of Wernerite, which is from Quebec. These are from the Mount Saint-Hilaire area. Pretty vivid yellows and purples. Here we have, uh, there, it's not over the entire mineral, but this section has uh, a pink fluorescence, and this is from uh, Terlingua, Texas. It's a variety of calcite. And there's actually a larger piece of that here. Really, very beautiful hue. And we'll be seeing something pretty unique about this in a few more minutes. And by the way, here is a uh, vintage piece of uranium glass. So the green fluorescence that you're seeing here is uh, due to uranyl ions in the glass. It's very mildly radioactive, not much but gives it a beautiful uh, green hue. And of course, there is the uh, ubiquitous uh, zinc sulfide, which is extremely bright. This is a synthetic powder, but uh, really very bright. Now, if we switch to 253 nanometers, which is produced by a mercury vapor lamp, we can see some of the things we were seeing before, but this is rather interesting. The salmon pink is now really a blue. And uh, there's one more property that's rather unique, which is that if we put it right up against the light and then remove the light, you'll notice that it's continuing to phosphoresce blue for seconds and seconds after being exposed. And what happens in fluorescence is that the elements are excited to higher energy states, and normally they decay immediately, releasing light that is redder. Uh, but in this case, these are electrons that are taking a long time to find their way home, but the result is a beautiful time-decaying phosphorescence. A red fluorescing calcite. So you see here that there are uh, red and green, kind of a Christmassy effect, very, very nice. In each case, it's the calcite that's glowing red, it's the willemite that's glowing green. When I visit companies that perform DNA sequencing, uh, I am prone to bring a portable lamp and a few rocks in me pocket. Uh, so maybe uh, these four. I'd say, hey, there we are, A, G, C, and T. And by the way, fluorescence in microscopy is incredibly faint. If you hit it with a million photons, maybe six come back. So it's like a lightning bolt goes off, and while the lightning bolt is flashing, you have to detect the fluorescence. Now, fortunately, it's at a different wavelength. It's at a redder wavelength. And so very sophisticated multi-layer uh, dielectric coatings are able to discriminate between the wavelengths and let you see them. And with that, let's bring up the house lights. Now, fluorescence microscopy uses molecular probes that have fluorescent organic molecules tied to them. And it turns out that that technique is an extraordinarily powerful one for a very wide range of diagnostic and other applications. One of those other applications is DNA sequencing. And today, almost all DNA sequencing that is performed uses microscopy, optics, and in particular, fluorescence. 
we actually have a photo of uh, the fluorescent probes that we use. So the four vials that you're looking at each contain a different fluorophore. That fluorophore is coupled to uh, single-stranded snippets of DNA, and those snippets are nine base pairs long. So therefore, it's called a nonomer. And because there are four bases of DNA, the total number of combinations that you can get is four to the ninth power. So each of these four vials that you're looking at has what's called a degenerate nonomer. And by degenerate, it means that every possible combination of bases are there. The difference between the four vials is that if the base at the query position is, say, A, that will be the fluorophore that lights up green. There are four colors, and uh, the color that the objects light up reveals what that base was. And then those chemicals get removed, and a new collection of fluorodegenerate nonomer fluorophores go in, and uh, the next base is interrogated. But we do want to switch now to a photograph of a very small field of view. This was uh, about uh, 0.8 millimeters square. And in this image, you can see three of the four colors lit up. This is a superimposition of three separate images. So the RGB monitor is showing three of the fluorophores. But you can see there that they're on a patterned array and they're all lighting up. And basically, each one of those is going to be monitored for days to see what colors it changes as the bases are interrogated. And uh, that's my colorful tale of fluorescence. I hope you've enjoyed it.